Journey IFC strives to create safe spaces to worship God. Know that you are welcome just as you are, regardless of religious background or lack thereof, skin color, political affiliation, sexuality, age, culture, or any other label you own or society throws on you. You are welcomed and celebrated here just as you are. Faith and works. It's an interesting contrast. Let's go through it. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Surely that faith cannot save, can it? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily need, 
means. What is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from works, and I by my works will show you faith. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is worthless? Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and by works faith was brought to completion. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise, was not Rahab, the prostitute, also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Hey everyone, I'm back. Welcome to see. So this week, um, we enjoyed 4th of July. Um, we went out to, to Bernie, Texas um, to see Skyler's family. Um, and it's it's my, one of my favorite places. It's a beautiful piece of property that is removed from the world. And they have horses and cats and dogs and more cats and dogs. And they have a creek that runs through it that we can wade and swim in. And it's one of my happy places. And being there often helps me reset both physically and mentally, spiritually, emotionally, all that stuff. Um, but typically that means that I'm just hanging out my, at my in-laws house being really lazy, laying around and not getting much work done or any work done sometimes. And so this week's sloth was a, a very fitting sin for us to cover, cover as I spent a lot of this past week trying my best to not try my best. Um, and there was one point in the week, me and my mother-in-law, I think we all were sitting down at lunch, and Jennifer Lee, uh, who joins us actually online and is here today, um, she asked me about what is this week's sin going to be? And I was like, well, we're going to talk about sloth. And she said something I thought was interesting. She pointed out that um, isn't it interesting how popular sloths, the animals, have become in recent years? And I was like, wow, I've never thought about that. But yeah, really, they've become super popular. Sloths are on backpacks and school journals and pencil bags. Sloths are in commercials now and Disney movies and any, many memes on social media. So why is it that sloths become such a big part of pop culture? You do a quick Google search on that, and article after article from like 2017 and on talks about why people believe sloths are great and why they become so popular, and none of them really pointed out what the reason was. And I'm no sociologist, so I can't say for sure, but I have a couple of guesses as to why I think we like sloths so much. First off, I think sloths are ugly but cute in a strange and daring yeah. way, um, so I think that's a factor. But also, they're really slow. They're like really, really slow creatures, which is really funny for some reason, and it's really entertaining to watch. I don't know if you've seen videos of them moving. It's crazy. They're so slow. So everything they do from climbing trees to eating looks like they've been put in slow motion. So it's really interesting that in our highly capitalistic, hardworking society, we find comfort in the image of an animal that goes against our own natural speed. Sloths seem to be countercultural in that way. It's like they represent what we are not. They take their time and do not let the worries of the day keep them from their own schedule and keep them from taking their time at things at their own pace. Maybe that is one reason why we like them so much, I'm not sure. Maybe sloths are a reminder for us to slow down. On a societal level, we are in such a productive time in history and it's exhausting. After the Industrial Revolution and then what was called the Digital Revolution, we as humans have become super fast at what we do. What once took an entire family a week to get done can now probably take one person and a computer to get it done in less time. And although we have made things simpler and more streamlined, production has only ramped up. We have continued working ourselves and one another to the bone instead of allowing our technological advances to help us slow down. 
And now we see it becoming this pop culture thing that it's cool to be into slots and also self-care. And we have new resources coming out about high rates of burnout and how we are all a little overwhelmed and overworked. COVID seemed to teach us this and, and it taught us that less is more, that we are often overrun by our schedules and our overprogrammed lives. But it seems that people, now that we're in this new stage of COVID, have returned back to the grind. Now that they can gather back in their offices without masks, it's like we forgot what we learned. We have been encouraged to do less, and I think a lot of us crave less, but it somehow feels like a bad thing to crave less. And sometimes it feels like a sin if we start falling behind our old patterns of work. The history of sloth um, and why it was included in the list of Sedley, deadly sins is interesting. It goes way back to the 4th century AD. This was around the time when the great Roman Empire had just fallen, and there was this kind of collective feeling that all things were meant to end. If Rome couldn't make it, nothing would make it. And so it was a really hopeless time in history. And at this time, there were monks living in the desert regions of Egypt, and they noticed that around noontime, they became lazier and lethargic, and their minds started going to darker places. They didn't want to do their work. They didn't want to pray. They were just done with it all. And as they looked up in the sky and saw the sun, it didn't seem to be moving at all. They were just counting down the hours until they could be done. Eventually, this phenomenon was given a name, Acadia, meaning lack of care. Noting the time of day when people started getting a little slothful and caring a little less. And then Acadia was personified into what became known as, and I love this, the demon of noontide. So the, this was a demonic force that they believed caused one person to become sluggish or bored, or that created space for one to doubt their work, their calling, their passions, all of that. And so monks were actually taught how to fight off these temptations of this demon of noontide in a couple of ways. One of the ways was that they were told that you can cry. Because <laughs> tears would help show that they actually do care, that they don't lack care. Because if you can cry, you, you care. Then they were told to just, you know, simply balance your prayer and work. So if you're tired of work, just pray a little more, right? Or if you don't want to pray, just work a little more. And so they just need to make sure to have enough time to do both. They're also taught to contemplate their own death, which would remind them or scare them back into work. <laughs> and if none of that worked, they could try the plain old perseverance route, the old pull yourselves up by the bootstraps kind of advice. So to overcome slothful ways, monks were told to cry, create better boundaries between work and prayer, think about death, or just persevere through it. I don't know about you, but hearing that, I think I want to be more slothful. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to do any of those things. Cry and think about death, I don't, I don't know about that. It seems to me that sloth is not a demon itself, but instead is a symptom or product of something else that I think these suggested tools cannot overcome. Maybe sloth is a sign that people are unhappy with their lives and work and want something different, but aren't sure exactly how to make that change happen. This could be due to tough life circumstances or mental health issues like anxiety or depression, none of which are sins, I want to say. This may lead people to focus on themselves and their needs and what they are or are not doing. And it becomes possibly this eternal game of comparison where there are no winners, only victims of an act. <clears throat> Our reading today came from the book of James, which is all about action. In it, the author is encouraging followers of Christ to put their faith into action, saying, faith without works is dead. Meaning, if you do nothing, i.e. act slothful, you have no faith, at least seemingly so. Then two examples of faith slash works are provided that I think are strange. First, we get Abraham, who was put, who put his faith into action by offering his son Isaac up for sacrifice. And honestly, I hear that, and I'm like, that's a terrible example. Yeah. That is not how we put our faith into action. Abraham tried to kill his son as an offering to God, but the story ends with God stopping Abraham's work before it is even completed. Is that really the best example of putting our faith into action, sacrifice? I hope it's not. I think we have better reasons. Was it Abraham's work that saved him, or was it the cessation of his work that saved him? 
Then we get the second story of Rahab, who was a courtesan, which is a nicer, more appropriate way of saying prostitute, who protected some spies that came into her house, and, and she was protecting them from Jericho, and they were the Israelites, and, and so her bringing them in saved their lives, and it eventually led to the downfall of Jericho, which was her hometown. Rahab's actions helped save the Israelites, but it led to the, the downfall of her own people, but it did save her family. In return for sparing you know, their lives, her family was spared in it as well. Yet again, another weird example about putting faith into action. When really both of these stories show us what happens when we stop work from taking place. In the first case, Abraham is stopped from killing. In the second case, Rahab stops the spies from killing her family and also stops her people from killing the spies. It makes me wonder, what if the work we are called to is simpler than we think? What if we don't have to sacrifice our firstborn sons or welcome spies into our households? At the beginning of our reading from the book of James, the author says, If a brother or sister or sibling is naked and lacks daily food, and you say, Go in peace, keep warm and eat, and yet you do not supply their needs, what is the good of that? Maybe sloth is not about being lazy in the afternoon, it is instead about following up on the care we have offered to give. And maybe this is our solution to sloth. When we find ourselves hanging with the demon of noontide, we can try stopping and slowing down and remembering what we have offered to give the world. We can try to take note of what work we feel called to and also what work we do not feel called to. Instead of getting caught up in that vicious cycle of thinking about what we are lacking in, what we are not doing, maybe we can begin to look around us and see how, how we can do what we love to do and how we can do that in service of others. If we say we want to live a life following the practices of this Jesus guy, and yet we sit on our hands and give people only our thoughts and prayers, our faith is indeed dead. We cannot be completely inactive. We have to put out the work that we want to see in the world. But, I'm going to qualify that, but that does not mean we have to constantly be working. The problem with calling sloth a deadly sin is that we have taken it from its original context and have superimposed it onto our modern standards of workplace practices. Therefore, we can feel like sinners when we let deadlines slip or when we have to reschedule a meeting. We feel the weight of this so-called deadly sin hover, hover over us, waiting for us to take too long of a break or waiting for us to hit our 40 hours for the week. When early sloth was originally about cultivating our passions and checking back in on our mental health at a time when they were doing way less than we are doing today. Sloth was a sign or a symptom of an unhappy life that required some work to make some change happen. The demon of noontide was a reminder to reevaluate what we are called to do and what we can let go of to free us from inaction. I think we are so removed from sloth's original sin that we live in a modern version of sloth. I think those early monks would look at our lives and see how busy we are all the time and still call us slothful. They could see our workaholic culture and realize that many of us lack care for our jobs and our personal time. They would see many people who have lost track of our passions and who have lost track of the people we want to serve. Because while we are called to work, you know, put our faith into action, we are not called to overwork, to the point where we are burnt out and finding solace with this demon of noontide. Therefore, I think the sin of sloth reminds us to set healthy boundaries, something we talk about at Journey Alone, around our time and our work so that we can be sustained in what we offer the world. It makes sense that there will come times when we do not want to work, when we need rest, when rules and duties seem to be too much. Maybe it's the hottest part of the day when the sun isn't moving fast enough. It makes sense that we can start questioning our lives and our callings. We may turn to distractions like social media or TV or news, movies, books to get away from the work of figuring out what is wrong, what needs to be changed in our lives, instead of facing it head on. 
when we start to feel lethargic or lazy or slothful, whatever we want to call it, maybe the world is telling us to stop for a while and slow down, to take account of our boundaries and our schedules, and to take steps to make sure that our lives are fun, that are enjoyable, that they're restful to live. And maybe we can then remember what makes us come alive and then go and do that. I knew a priest who would uh, tell a story about a time when he tried to take on meditation as a spiritual practice, which I know I've struggled with. You know, Mary, we struggled with this together. And so he went to his bishop who was over him for help because he kept falling asleep every time he would meditate and he just felt so guilty. So he went to the bishop and he was like, I'm just not sure what I'm doing wrong. I'm trying my best, but I just can't do it. Every time I sit down to meditate, I just fall asleep. What do I do? So the bishop looked at the priest right in the eyes and said, well, maybe God is telling you to go to sleep. <laughs> and I thought that was such a good, insightful way of looking at that. Maybe the feelings of sloth that we are feeling at noontime are telling us that it is time to rest as well. Because we also have other scripture where Jesus says in, in Matthew 11, to come to him, all of us who are weary and who are carrying heavy burdens and we will find rest. For his yoke is easy and the burden is light. See, the work we are being called to is simple, but it can make us tired. So may we walk the line between action and inaction as we navigate these boundaries and learn to slow down like the mighty sloth. In closing, I want to share a story that will lead us into an activity I have for us today. So in seminary, I took a class with a really awesome professor named Dr. Jensen, who actually went on the Israel trip with us. And he taught our second theology class. Um, and so at one point in the class, he taught us about Karl Barth, who was one of the big theologians of, you know, kind of recent history. And apparently Karl Barth would start each and every day by waking up and listening to Mozart's music. Barth was quoted by saying that Mozart's music does not wish to say anything he just sings and sounds. He does not force anything on the listener. He simply leaves him free. He continues saying that Mozart's music always sounds unburdened, effortless, light. And this is why, to Bart, it unburdens, releases, and liberates us. End quote. After explaining Karl Barth's history with Mozart's music to us, Dr. Jensen also explained Bart's troubled life at home, including an affair, that a long-time affair that he had on his wife, and, and just the struggles he was going through. And so Dr. Jensen played a song that we're going to hear in a moment. Um, it's one of Mozart's pieces. And we sat and we just listened to it. And so after my class sat and listened to this song, Dr. Jensen tried to continue on with the lesson, but he was too choked up to get any words out. Listening to the music and reflecting on Bart's life brought tears to Dr. Jensen's eyes, and then all of our eyes, because that, you know, that happens. And so we were only halfway through class at this time, and Dr. Jensen said, you know what, guys, that's enough today. And he sent us on our way. It was a reminder that inaction is not always a bad thing. And sometimes doing or saying nothing is saying everything. It also taught me that sometimes music can liberate us and help us fight this demon of noontide as we are reminded of the good and simple works happening all around us that we may find in the music of Mozart. And so I invite all of us to sit and listen to Mozart's Serenade Number 10 for Winds. Um, and I invite you, you're not going to do any work during this time, no work, but I just want you to simply sit and listen and be liberated by this music allowing whatever you need to hear or think about to come to mind. And then afterwards we'll have um, some time uh, after the song to share if anything came up for us, if, if anything bubbled up that we want to share. Um, but you'll know there's this kind of repetitive um, little piece that you'll hear throughout this. Um, and I hope it can help us be restful and fight this um, demon in the meantime. So, just listen. So this is, de I definitely think this is a new song, A Journey. Um, but it's actually um, one that Margaret suggested, and I want to point out, it's churchy. Margaret does it to churchy songs. <laughs> so thank you, Margaret, for the song. Um, and this was a song I used to sing. Um, I played guitar and sang for our worship service on our campus in college. And this was one that me and my friend Stephanie sang. 
and it's cool because now we're both pastors. She's working in Colorado, and I'm here in Austin. And so my notes have her initial next to lines, but she won't be seeing those. I will be seeing them all. Uh, but it makes me think of Stephanie, and uh, yeah, this is one of my old favorites. So Margaret says I like the lyrics, but I've never heard it before. Yeah, she likes the lyrics, but she's never heard it before. Thank you, Margaret. siesta actually helps them finish their day because the heat of the day can kill you. <laughs> and I'd also like to point out, leave it to journey to point out what some people believe is a mortal sin to actually be a virtue. <laughs> That's how we do it here. That's how we roll. <laughs> know this in the blessing. Think about Jesus and his ministry. No miracle of value didn't come without a lot of slow approach and what some people call slothfulness. Jesus, if you'd only been here three days earlier, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Christ, if you'd just hurried, my daughter wouldn't be dead. If you hadn't begged your father to find another way to atone for the sins that involve this world. 
where would we be? So know this, embrace slothfulness. Sometimes what comes at the end of slothfulness, journey's virtue, of course, sometimes is much more worth the wait. Go in peace, take this week very slothfully, and know the grace of God through it. Amen. Amen. Amen.